Good morning <clears throat> again. <laughs> How many believe the Bible to be true? You know, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 29, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. You know, that's a pretty powerful verse when we think about it, because, you know, we, we are so accustomed, I think, to thinking the worst of God when he talks about or he thinks about us. And because we know how frail and, and all the crazy dumb things we do sometimes, but nothing could be further from the truth. And God looks at us, and, and truly he says that he thinks thoughts of peace to, about us. And that's amazing when we think about it. And so, you know, first off, we need to understand that God loves us more than anything that we could have imagined him to. That, um, that's the greatest message for mankind today, that no matter how bad we've blown it, no matter how bad we think we are, God still loves us regardless of what we've said or done. He's an awesome God. And uh, he's made a way of hope for us, hasn't he? He's given us Jesus Christ so that we can, we can see him someday and that we can experience the love and the acceptance that he has had um, to us in our, the redemption that he's provided through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this privilege and opportunity we have to come together this morning. I thank you for your word and the hope and peace that it gives to us. Father, the direction and the strength, and I pray that you would help us, Lord, this morning to hear what you would have for us today. Lord, that we would take this message, apply it to our lives, and be drawn closer to you, Father. I pray that you'd help me to share what you'd have me to share. Help us each to be sensitive to your spirit, Lord. We love you, we thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So with that said, I would say that why you follow Christ will determine what you do for him. And uh, I've had that thought, and I, I write it down on my, uh, my phone quite a, quite a while ago, but I thought it was an interesting statement that why you follow Christ will determine what you do for him. And so when we think about that, um, if he is nothing more than a ticket to heaven, well, then he may not be, because um, this may not verbally be your stance, but actions show those things. And so I want to talk today a little bit about um, serving God and just faith in him. Um, if, he's, if he is your life, it will show, won't it? If, if he is the cornerstone, if he is the direction that your life is going in, then it will be evident by the things you do. People will take note of those kind of things. Um, one way or another, words or actions, you're showing others who you are, or who you are serving. Um, sometimes it's not good, and sometimes we don't realize what we're actually portraying in life. He may call someone to public ministry and, uh, or an evangelistic one. God calls each and every one of us to different things. And that's the neat thing about serving Christ. And that's the unique thing about this body here. We, there are many things that God has called each of us to do. Some things that we have specialized in. Sometimes he calls us um, to do something that might have a great influence or sometimes he might cause us to do something that is almost insignificant, almost, because nothing is insignificant when God calls us to do something. There's all a, always a purpose involved. So he might select someone for a public ministry, an evangelistic one. He might call someone to a foreign land or to be a missionary in a foreign land. And we know that going someplace overseas or wherever, we're not always missionaries. It could be just to, for us to serve a purpose. One of, the, I think, the greatest times in my life was uh, when we went down to Costa Rica a few times, and I can't tell you how much I enjoyed doing that. I wasn't the speaker. I was just there as a helper. And I'll tell you, that was, uh, that was a fantastic time for me. I mean, I love helping and working and stuff, and that was just a neat opportunity. And I believe it's just an area that God was using me in, and I loved it. But he may choose us to work locally, to do something here on a project, or there's a million other ways that God can use each and every one of us. And, and to some degree, we know, you know, we know what God is calling us to do in, in, a, in a, some fashion or another. We know what we feel joy in and comfort in doing. And um, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12:12, 12, 12, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized into one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, 
and we were all given to one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. So the goal of our body, the goal, if you were to just look at your body itself, you know how it works. You know if there's a problem and so on and so forth. So we are the body of Christ. And so our goal as the body of Christ is to glorify God, however that may be. And whether, as I said, whether it's great or small, it matters not. It is our faith and our obedience that honors God. And to that end, in order for this body to function, it has to be committed to the goal. The body has to be committed to that goal. Just as your personal life is committed towards something, you are, um, whatever you are working towards in life, that your makeup is working towards that end, so is this body of Christ. We must work in unison to glorify God, and that's what the body does, the body of Christ. We know that if the body has a problem, our physical bodies have a problem, we don't wait to take care of that issue. We try to get it resolved as much as possible. It could be detrimental to the whole body if we don't take care of things. And sadly, we know that in this life that we live, it, it uh, does strange things to us, whether we want it to or not. But, you know, we all suffer and degrade, you know, ever since birth. Sometimes taking care means removing pieces, things that hurt. Not a pleasant thought, but necessary at times. And even if the removal of parts, it's for the benefit of the whole body so it can continue. And that's even talking about our physical aspect. There are people who have amputations and stuff, but if they were to allow it to continue, it would be detrimental to the whole body. And so even in the body of Christ, there are things that need to be taken care of. And we need to make sure that our focus is on serving Christ. And so it is with the body of Christ. In Ephesians 4, 1, it says, As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is over all and through all in all. But to each one is given us, given um, as Christ apportioned it. Verse 11 says, So Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelisms, and, te and such. So equip to equip his people for the work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And so those are a few months ago, actually, I was thinking of verse 11, you know, and I was thinking about the body of Christ and the purpose of the body of Christ. And, I, and this, this verse came to my mind so that, you know, God gave the people that are outlined in that verse, whatever they are, male or female, to make up those roles for a particular person or purpose. In verse 12, it says to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, that we no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speak the truth in love. We will grow and become in every respect a mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. For in him the whole body, joined and held together in every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And you've seen, interestingly enough, if, you, if you've watched, you know, these older shows, and maybe there's some newer ones, you know, where you got this big old um, galleon, you know, racing in the ocean someplace, and then, you know, you see all the little oars on the outside, but on the inside, you see this, these rows of generally men sitting down there, you know, to a drum beat, right? They're pounding, and as they're doing that, they're, they're taking these, these oars, and they're just rowing, and I could, uh, couldn't imagine how that would have been um, to do that, but nonetheless, apparently they do. And so it was an effort to move that ship. And the funny thing was is that everybody had to move in unison for that ship to continue to go straight or 
it would be confusion. If one side rolled faster than the other side, then the ship would start turning and you'd never make it where you needed to be. They were all working together. And even today, that kind of stuff happens, doesn't it? I mean, you've seen those, those kayak canoe races they have for Olympic type things where you've got seven or nine guys on a thing and they're all like moving together. One messes up and it stops. And you may have experienced in your own life, if you've taken a kayak, a two-seater, or maybe a, a canoe, and everybody's been in there and, and you mess up and you see what it costs everybody. It's, it's confusion. And uh, so it is with the body of Christ. He is our heartbeat. He is the, the drummer. He is the one who is causing each of us to follow his direction. There was an article in a small church bulletin and it said, for centuries, the principal responsibility for evangelism has been borne by the clergy. The laity were neither called to evangelistic activity nor believed it was their responsibility. One of the most significant developments in the church, possibly the single most important development in recent centuries, is the revival of laity, lay activity and the growing recognition that the layman is called to a ministry no less important than that of a minister. Elton Trueblood once said, the Reformation has opened up the Bible to the common man. The new Reformation will open up the ministry to the common man. So each and every one of us, basically when we've accepted Christ as Savior, have become a minister, haven't we? We are all ministers of the gospel. We all have the potential to minister to somebody, and we should be. We should be doing those kind of things. And it may not be a public ministry that you have sitting here, but we all give messages of hopes to other individuals that we meet on a daily basis. In Matthew 16, 15, this is kind of interesting as I was writing all this stuff, it's kind of like popped into my head, this great commission, right? He said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature or to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And look at verse 16, 17, it says, And these signs shall accompany who? Those who believe. So it's not just the disciples that Jesus is speaking to here, but this, this commission has gone out to all those individuals who believe. Through him, in my name, they, each and every one of us, will drive out demons, they'll speak with new tongues, they'll pick up snakes in their hands, they will drink deadly poison. Well, not, he's not telling you to do that, he's just saying that he'll protect you. They will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well. So again, I would say, why, why you follow Christ will determine what you do for him. And it's kind of interesting because it really does show if we're serving Christ because we love him, then our actions are going to produce those things. And we'll get into James a little bit. There are folks who did many or few acts that are commented for in Hebrews chapter 11. It's the great faith chapter, right? We won't read too much from there. But those individuals in there did some pretty great things, pretty momentous things. They were well-known individuals, but then you had individuals who did, did small things, but still they were pointed out as an act of faith. It might be one battle. It might be through the reign of a king. It might have been one for one particular time, as in Esther, right? You read the book of Esther. She was just there for that moment in time and did what she did to save the Jews again from the Amalekites, Mordecai or Haman. And so you see just a simple thing, but what a tremendous effect it had on the nation. God used her at that particular point in time. It was just one time. Or the life of Samuel. You look at Samuel, and his whole life was committed to serving God. His mother gave him to Eli when he was a small boy, and he lived his whole life serving God. So it could be small or great. One woman gave an insignificant amount of money in an offering, and her act is remembered today. It is recorded in the Word of God. In Mark chapter 12, verse 42 through 4, it says, But the poor woman came and put two very small copper coins, worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor woman hath put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. And this is kind of interesting. Even that little three verses there, it talks about, I mean, could you imagine, you know, sitting around, you're in the city square or wherever they're putting this money and this offering, 
And, you know, you see all these people. But, you know, we do the same thing to a degree. We sit around, we watch people, and there are people who attract our attention. There's something different about somebody. It could be the way they dress, the way they act, what, whatever they're doing, something. But it calls attention to them. And here Jesus is sitting in a similar situation, and he watched this widow woman, and she gave two mites. Compared to the wealth of the temple, she, what she gave wasn't worth a thing. It was insignificant as to what she did. But you know what God did? You know what Jesus did with that? He took those two mites and he just kissed them into a coin and the gold of heaven and made them more valuable than anything any of those rich men could have ever given. Do you know why? Because he saw that she kept nothing for herself, but she gave all to him. Her love and devotion were the gift. And that is what God measures in our lives. The depth of the selflessness that we have. And he records those things. One guy did just one thing. Yeah, particularly, one, this guy particularly. He was written down, and it confounds people today. Of course, it was kind of a big thing. He built a boat on a mountain, right? Of course, we know who we're talking about, Noah. And it's kind of interesting when you read about that because Hebrews chapter 7 or 11 verse 7 says, by faith Noah, because we just think, you know, God talked to him and he built this boat out in the middle of the Ararat Mountains. And so it said, God warned him about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. And by faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping by faith. The Bible didn't say it doesn't say anything about whether or not his sons participated in the building of this great boat. I was looking up some things, and I've heard throughout the years that, you know, there was, um, they found the, the actual Noah's Ark up on Mount Ararat, and it was enclosed in like a glacier up there. And so from time to time, you could actually, the glacier pulls away, and you could see part of it. And that's what I've always thought. But as I was looking at something else, I found another spot they claimed to be Noah's Ark, and it it's, it's in the Ararat mountain range, so it's about 6,000 or so feet up, but it almost looks like a, an, an eye, you know, it's got this kind of a shape, and it looks basically like a skeleton in the ground, and it's covered in, in dirt and stuff, and they found some crazy things. I'm not saying it is, but other people are, but uh, it's interesting how significant that thing is, how that boat is, if you will, to the world, if they could find proof of that, but his sons, they may have been living in a different area. They may not even, you know, they might have had different occupations. And um, they might have heard about some old guy building some boat on a mountain. And it was kind of funny, poking fun at the old man until they found out it was their dad, right? So they go back or they, they I don't know what it says about their interaction with this, but the most important thing you can do, and that's the interesting thing about this story, because Moses' children or his sons got on the boat with their wives and his, and, and his wife, and, and they got on that boat. And so probably one of the most important things you can do is to witness to your family. It is so important that we make sure that they hear the word of God, and not only by continually giving them the gospel, but by our actions and letting them see that our relationship with God is real. If, it, if your life doesn't line up with what you preach, it becomes obvious, and we've seen too much of that. But if your life lines up with the Word of God, it's going to make an impact on their lives. Consider Lot's family. You saw Noah's family, and they followed him under the ark, but consider Lot's family. The angels told Lot that they were going to destroy the city, and they needed to get out in Genesis 14. Get your family out and leave. Uh, Genesis, I'm sorry, 19 verse 14 says, So Lot went and spoke to his sons-in-laws and they, who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, Hurry and get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his son-in-law thought he was joking. I mean, that tells you a whole lot about the character of Lot. It told you about what kind of an influence, a godly influence, he had not only on his family, but in that place. He spent years down in the city of Sodom. He learned to tolerate the sin that was so prevalent in that land. And although he called it wickedness, he had seen his sons and daughters grow up in that. And they apparently had married among the people with those standards, those ethical standards that were there in Sodom at the time. 
And when the time came for the, the, the lot got the word from the Lord to leave the city, they, they just looked at him and, and laughed at him because, and they ridiculed him because of that. He had lived so long as one of them without any real difference that they took his warning as a joke. And the man was out of the will of God in this place and he had not, no witness for God. That is a tragic life, but that is real today. I mean, there are people who are just exactly what we talk about. They say the right words, but their lives don't line up with that, and people recognize that. Those closest to them recognize the hypocrisy and want nothing to do with it. The same principle today. When you go down to the level of the world and live as the world, you will not win them. And I think that's pretty clearly stated today in our world. Noah continues to build the ark because he believed God. He chose to obey God. Many of us have heard the word for years without making too much of a difference. Hebrews 2, 1 through 3 says, Therefore we ought to give more earnest heed to the things that were heard, lest happily we drift away from them. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which having at the first been spoken through the Lord was confirmed unto us by them that heard it? It's kind of interesting when you look at that. When we see the word of God, we all have a Bible or a number of them. And we read these things and we ask ourselves, what kind of a difference has it made in our lives? You look at the word of God and, you know, we know the word says that God's the same yesterday, today and forever and will always be, right? Why won't God change? The world wants us to accept, say, the, the sins that they create laws to protect. Why will God's word never change? It's written in stone. It is his word. When he says everything that God has written from Genesis to Revelation, everything that he said, every promise he's made, every prophecy that has been given is going to be fulfilled because God said it. Whether we believe it's going to or not, we should. We should, as children of God, know it's going to happen. But God is not going to change. He's not going to erase a portion of his Bible and say, okay, I've, I've, I've rethought this situation. And so we're, I'm, not, I'm going to let you guys slide on this one because, I mean, the whole world's going that way, so it's got to be good, right? I don't want to destroy all those people. But the reality of it is his word is true and sin is sin. And he will not change that and his word will be fulfilled. So the interesting question out of verse 3 was, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, if we neglect. You see, that's the thing. We hear the words, and sometimes they just pass right on through, like we're not even listening. Neglect is to pay little or no attention, to fail to heed, disregard, to fail to care for or attend to properly, to fail to carry out as though carelessness or oversight. This is not to the time to snuggle up close to the world. This is not the time to allow the world to influence and to get comfortable in our relationship with it and kind of like put God at bay, if you will. As the writer of Hebrews says, we can't neglect the word of God. If we know it, we are responsible. And that's one of the things about hearing the word of God. Once you hear of the plan of salvation, you are always forever going to be changed by it. Whether you accept it or reject it, you will never forget it. You will always hear about the depth of the love that God has for you, about the peace that he has for you, about the forgiveness that he has for you, about the hope that he has for you. We will never be able to get it out of our mind because the Holy Spirit will continually draw us. And use those verses, use that person, use that situation to draw us into a relationship with him again so that we can be an effective part of the body, so that we can be used of God in some capacity to be able to draw the world unto him through his Holy Spirit. James says, dear brothers, what's the use of saying that you have faith in our Christians if you are proving it by helping others, what kind of faith can save anyone? If you have a friend who is in need of food and clothing and you say to him, well, goodbye and God bless you, stay warm and eat heartily and don't give him clothes or food, 
What good does that do? So you see, it isn't just to have faith. You must do good to prove that you have it. See, we hear in the word, it says that you are justified by faith that, and not of works. So we know that we are born again by faith. And James seems to be contradicting that by saying you got to have works, but he's really not contradicting it at all. He's saying that a life of faith is going to produce works. And that's what he's asking us to do. If you have faith in God, and that's what the question really does, that why you love God will determine what you do for him. And that's what James is saying here. If you love God, if you have faith in God, your life is going to manifest fruits of one way or another. And if there's no fruit there, you need to evaluate your relationship with God. Why am I serving him? 17 says, so you see, it isn't, it isn't enough just to have faith. You must also do good to prove that you have it. Faith that doesn't show itself by good works is no faith at all. It is dead and useless. But someone may well argue, you say the way to God is by faith alone, plus nothing. Well, I say that good works are important too, for without good works, you can't prove whether you have faith or not. But anyone can see that I have faith by the way I act. There's a story told that the devil had a meeting with his demons to decide how to persuade men um, to, that God is non-existent. So since they themselves believed in his existence, right, the demons fear and tremble, they, they wondered just how it would be done. So one demon suggested that they tell people that Christ never really existed and that men should not believe such fiction. Another demon suggested that they persuade men that death ends all and that there's no need to worry about the afterlife. Finally, one of the more intelligent demons steps up to the plate and he says, well, let's just tell them that Jesus Christ is real, that by believing in him, you can be saved, but all you have to do is profess faith in Christ and you can get, go on living the way you used to. And that seems to be what was adopted because that seems to be what's happening today. Now, maybe it was a cute little story to make a, a, a to compare today's society, but that seems to be the way it is. We can believe in Christ and we can think that we're saved. And that's why I started this by saying, if Jesus is your ticket to heaven, well, he may not be. If your life doesn't line up with it, if you think you've accepted Christ and there's nothing in your life that is being produced a fruit then where is your faith in God? It's just a false hope that we have, and God is asking us to follow him, to finish up strong. And as we, we know by the way this world is going, that this world is really moving quickly towards the end. And we should be focusing on those things that God has called us to do or wants us to do. James 2, 19 through 26 says, or 9 and 26 are there still some among you who hold that only believing is enough? Believing is one in one God. Well, remember that the demons believe also so strongly that they tremble in terror. Fool, when will you ever learn that believing is useless without doing what God wants you to? Faith that does not result in good deeds is not real faith at all. Verse 26 says, just as the body is dead when there is no spirit, so faith is dead if it is not the kind that results in good deeds. And I think sometimes as I was writing all this, and I was thinking of JFK, right? In his famous statement, ask not what you can do or God, their country can do for you, but what God, you can do for your country. It's the same with us and God. Sometimes we get stuck in this little bubble by thinking that you know, our life is so miserable and, and we get stuck in that misery when God has called us out of that, he has given us everything that is necessary to produce fruit. Now, don't get me wrong. Your life might prove as an example to someone. You might be living in a horrible situation, but our attitude in those times could glorify God and be a tremendous influence on the people around us. And we know people like that. Some of us have experienced those kind of times where we have been through a very difficult time in our life and because our relationship with God was so close, his presence was so near, people saw that and they marveled at what God was doing in your life. That is faith. When you can stand in those difficult times and glorify God in the, and there's joy because our joy is not dependent on anything that happens in this world, right? 
Our joy is based on what God has done for us. It's an internal living water that wells up within us, and that produces our joy. So God is asking us today to evaluate why are we serving him so that we just get a ticket to heaven or because we love him. We want to do what is pleasing to him. And there's a lot I know that we've shared, but the real the, the benefit or the thing about all this is just serving God and being strong in our relationship and our faith with him. We know that he's real. And he asks us to draw close to him. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. And we thank you for this time that we have to come together today. Lord, we thank you for your word that you have given us. And Lord, we know that it is true. We have seen through events in the world. We have seen down through time your prophecies fulfilled. And we know that someday, Lord, as you've declared, you are coming again. And Lord, we look forward to that day. Father, when, when you will reign supreme, Father, and that we will be with you. And I pray, Father, that you would help us each. I don't know what goes on in our hearts, Lord, but you do. Lord, if we are not making a difference, if we've ruined our testimony, help us, Lord, to make it right. Help us, Lord, to surrender to you again, Father, and Lord, ask forgiveness for those lives that we've affected, and sometimes it's difficult. But God, I pray that you'd give us the strength so that we can change for your glory. God, I praise you and I thank you for each one who's come out to this morning. And maybe you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you would like to do that. Um, can we see your hand and we'll pray for you right where you are. Father, we thank you for this time. And I pray that you would help these things to just speak to our hearts, Lord, so that we can finish strong. So that when we stand before you someday, we will hear those words well done, thou good and faithful servant. We praise you, Lord. We thank you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?